Good morning, and welcome to this final session in the House Symposium. Just a reminder, um, if you have questions for any of the um, speakers today, um, you can submit those through the Vimeo uh, live platform or by sending an email to the house200 at canterburymuseum.com address. This first paper in this session um, is a subject very close to my heart, the MOA of Canterbury Museum and the exchanges made um, around the world and specifically to the Viennese MOA. And this presentation will be given by Dr. Matthias Hahauser um, with co-authors Dr. Stephanie Jovanovic uh, Kruspal and Dr. Ursula Golik. Um, Dr. Hahauser is head of the uh, Geological and Paleontological Department of the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And as such, he's responsible in, indeed for the collections that, uh, especially those of the fossils that were sent by Haast um, and Hostjeda um, to Vienna and the exchange material that Haast sent to Vienna um, subsequently. And his research focuses on the paleogeography of Eurasia over the last 30 million years. The co-authors, um, Dr. Stephanie um, Jovanovic Krispel, is an art historian and communication scientist and deputy head of the archives department of science history at the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And um, Dr. Ursula um, Golich, a colleague of mine in paleoornithology, um, is the curator of vertebrate um, paleontology at the Vienna Museum. Um, <clears throat> she um, is also an associate professor of paleontology at the University of um, Munich. And she, as I mentioned, is a specialist in um, uh, paleoornithology and also in elephant um, paleontology. So I'm really looking forward to this talk and I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Matthias Haashauser. Many thanks for the introduction and good evening because it's, it's one o'clock in, in, the, in the night here. So it's a, we are really on, on the opposite side of the world. And for you, it's obvious that the topic, the story about the mowers in Vienna, but for the broader public in, in Austria, it's always surprising to hear that we have such a, a tight correlation uh, relation with New Zealand. And especially the Natural History Museum in Vienna is, is storing and housing a nice collection of, of material from New Zealand. And as it's quite some um, distance from here to you, I invite you in, to visit my museum now virtually, so have a look into this imperial building, which was the frame for these collections. So, as you all know, the ultimate story behind having this material in Vienna, dealing to Hochstetter, of course, and of course to the circumnavigation of the Novara. Uh, we always used to see Hochstetter in these build in these pictures. He's already an old guy. Uh, very honorable. But in fact, when he started with the, with the Novara, this was a twin. He was a young guy. He was in the, in the stepping, in the beginning of his career, and he was very aware of this, that this could be the stepping stone for his career, and so he was prepared for, for, for doing this. So, here's a picture of Paselini showing Hochstetter on the Novara in, in his office, and you see it's, it's really nicely equipped, so it, it was not a harsh circumstance to, to be on, on this Navarro. And we have had a small project now with the Academy of Science in Austria, and we had a look to the diaries of, of Hochstetter, especially the Auckland diary. And from that, we have some insights in, in how Hochstetter was, was seeing his, his task and how, how he was approaching the, the people there. And just by the way, that's a copy of the passport of Hochstetter. This, this was the passport uh, which allowed him to, to, to go to New Zealand. So uh, it's a little bit different from modern passports, but it's more beautiful probably. Uh, of course, when Hochstetter was, was going to uh, New Zealand, he already knew what he had to do there it's because he was uh, was planned to do some coal well for, for the Dury um, coal field. And just a second. 
he, he was an advocate of himself. He was a very clever guy. And already when arriving there, he started uh, to advertise himself. And then in his entire, he mentions already on January the 13th, today my report appeared in the government cassette. And some days later, he again notes, I hear my report has been reprinted in all New Zealand newspapers and that the public has already taken hold of my name to such an extent that they refer to me when refounding New Liverpool in the Karaka district. So New Liverpool never made it, but Hofstetter did it. And he also noted that my residence here is regarded as a favor rendered by one government to another. And I have every reason to be satisfied with the conditions under which I'm here and with the courteous ways in which the English government fulfills every wish I express. Reading his diary, it is obvious that the work uh, in, in this coal field was just something he had to do. But in fact, he was burning for the geology of New Zealand and he wanted to, to study abroad uh, all, all this, this new stuff around. And this is a, a, a glimpse in his diaries and you see it's, it's not easy to read them, but it's very detailed and partly even, even with some nice sketches involved. And I started to have, have a look in, in the first Auckland diary where he has been and to which localities he referred to. And from his diary, it was easy to produce such a map showing uh, how, how intensively he was studying the area and where he uh, tried to do some geological field work. So this was really a, a big task for Hochstetter, uh, which he did. But that's just one, one part, and, and you all probably know these things because you're aware of that. So this was the thing that he was more interested in than uh, doing this, this coal field studies in, in Drury. He, he went to the field uh, studying the geology, he was collecting fossils, and this material is still preserved in the Natural History Museum, uh, like these belemnites or the ammonites there. And you see this our original level there, uh, noting the date when it arrived and when it was inventorized, and that it was collected by Hochstetter. All these nice plants that he collected. And the material was published later, of course, in his, his Novara books. Uh, but one should not think that there was a collection of thousands of specimens. These are a few handful of specimens which arrived in Vienna and which are still housed there. So this was not the big uh, collection. And in, on page seven of his diary, he writes here, alone by the antipoden, alone with the antipodes. This is coquettish because he, he was by far not alone. Uh, I, I just went through the diary and counted people he, he met and, and people he referred to. And so he was not alone. He met around 90 people in, in the Auckland district. So pretty much people around. And one of these guys was Haast. And we, we find the first meeting of, of these guys also in the diary, but in, in his book, 863 in New Zealand, he describes his first meeting and he says, it was a particularly fortunate coincidence that I should also find a brave German here who became my inseparable traveling companion, who shared all the hardships of my forays in New Zealand and all the joys with me. I mean, my friend, Julius Haast. We soon found each other and became close friends. So that was in his book, but we can go back to the real stuff in his diary. And already on, on January the 11th, uh, Hochstetter writes, home in the morning, packed, visits after visits again. So he really had to do loads of, of, of social uh, contact there. At five o'clock with Haast, to the emigrant ship Evening Star, on which Haas arrived. So we find here the moment when Haas arrived more or less simultaneously with, with Hochstetter. In another note, he wrote, Haas is so kind, as I don't have time to describe Norara's stay in Auckland, and let me have his essay for the Wiener Zeitung, a newspaper. What's the story behind? Uh, Hochstetter regularly sent his, his reports to Vienna to advertise himself and Novara. And in this special case, he didn't have time to write the, the report by himself. And so he asked Haas to give him his report. Why could he do this? Because Haas did the same thing. Haas uh, sent reports on a regular way to Vienna. They were also published in the Wiener Zeitung. 
And these are descriptions of the journey of the landscape of New Zealand. And interestingly, obviously, his, his writing was not so clear. And in all his reports in the Wiener Zeitung, he is misspelled as Julius Haus instead of Haas. It's not easy. Also, all these, these newspaper reports are online today. You won't find him as Haas because he's misspelled. Slightly later, on, on January the 30s, how good it feels to be in my own house again. On my return, I found my room clean and nice, cleaned and swept. Friend Haas took care that this happened. Since my geognostic collections haven't arrived yet, I had time today, exclusively occupied with my botanical and ethnological collections. Haas helped me to sort the ferns. So these, these two young guys, these twins, were sitting together, uh, playing with the ferns, looking at, at the beetles, uh, talking about geology. So one really has to think about young guys who are in the beginning of the career, burning for, for, for science. So that's a, a, a nice image for me. And now the, story, the real story starts for the friendship because so far they just were in Auckland talking together, sitting at social dinners with other people. But at some point they had to go to field together. And this is described as well on February the 9th. There's the note by Hochstetter who writes, I had just crawled out of bed when the travel marshal came in and ordered that the dog car was ready. By the time everything was packed, it was 10 a.m., a cloudy, rainy sky. And when we were ready to leave, it was already raining. However, the weather only matters when traveling by water, not when making your way by land. So we were in good spirits. On this second excursion, Haast is my terrible companion for the first time. I hope that we get along. Haast drove. So obviously, they did get along very well. And this was the starting point of a, of a long-lasting friendship. So for the movers, we have to step to the next uh, diary on uh, his his. Um, Nelson diary, where Hochstetter was describing his trips, and those guys went to the Aura Valley. So, is this incident? Is this just just because they they were curious to go there? No, this was an absolutely clear uh, thought to go there and to look for things because there was the hot stuff. <laughs> wow, what was the background for this? What do I mean with this? Already in 1839, Richard Owen, the British paleontologist, he had one of these bones of a mower at hand, but it was incomplete. And at that time, in his first note in the, in the proceeding of the Zoological Society of London, he wrote, but so far as my skill in interpreting an osseous fragment may be credited, I'm willing to risk the reputation for it on the statement that there has existed, if there doesn't now exist in New Zealand, a Struchus bird nearly, if not quite, equal in size to the ostrich. So that was his first step in his business. And in 43, he was able to describe a full skeleton of this Dinornis. And you have to think of Owen as a pop star of paleontology. He really made it. He, he was selling his, his stories very well. And look at this picture of, of this, this proud guy holding the bone in hand. So this is not different from any pop star you can see on, on YouTube. And this didn't change because even in, in, as an old professor, there's a postcard again of Owen, again with a mower. So this was going through his life to be, be connected to the mower. And... This was known, of course, to Hochstetter and to Haast. So mowers have been really hot stuff. And so that was the reason why they really looked to, uh, to, to, to go there. And they dig there, the mowers, of course, and went back in Vienna. Hochstetter really started the mower hype in Vienna. And the first paper that he, he published was a, a paper on a talk given in 1861 on the extinct giant birds from New Zealand. And we have already seen this in, the, in a former talk. This was the first skeleton on, on display. Uh, this was mounted by Gustav Jäger, uh, who was, was director of the sewer at that time, and a report on a, on a nearly complete skeleton of, of this animal in 1863. So what happened with, with this? This was shown in the Novara Museum. And 
when the Novara Museum was closed in 1864, Hochstetter noted that it was now time to, to bring all the stuff from this museum to the, the uh, public institutions in Austria, to the, uh, to the museums. And he also noted that this skeleton was a gift by Curtis, Greenwood and Wells. They uh, donated this skeleton to the geological survey in Vienna, not to the museum that was not a big player at that time, it was the geological survey. So this skeleton really went to the geological survey there, where it was on display for nearly a century. And then in the 1950s, 1960s, the geological survey decided to, to give all the bone fossils they had to the Natural History Museum. And so this animal, this skeleton made its way to our collections. When the scientific mobile boom started, when uh, Hochstetter published his, his geology of New Zealand in 1864, he already described in much detail uh, how they, they found the Moa remains. And he noted ex uh, explicitly that they went together there and started to dig and they found the, the Moas, but he didn't have the time or he didn't want to spend the time to for a big excavation. So he let this to do Haast and he went on on his trip. And indeed Haast in the same book gave them a description of, of this excavation. He described uh, the geology of these caves and the contents. So he was always involved in this. So this was an eye level, both, both, both men working on this material. And this scientific war boom can be seen in, in additional papers. Again, Gustav Jäger was publishing a report on a nearly complete skull of, of one of these, these birds. And also Haast was always involved in this. So there was one uh, report by, by Haast in 1867, in, in the reports of the geological survey where he described new findings from uh, in New Zealand. He, uh, he writes about 118 specimens that he found. And he also mentions that he, he brought or he sent all his photos and, and measurements to Owen because he still was the Moa guy. And he also sent a, a set of bones to Kaup in, in Germany so he spread the material to, to Europe. On the other hand, still even Hochstetter was trying uh, to, to include Hochstetter's work in Vienna. And here in a, in a small report, again, in the geological survey in 1868, he writes about the attempts of Haast uh, in, in mounting new skeletons of Moors in the Canterbury Museum and he, he says there are six new skeletons, which are the absolute stars of the exhibitions. So this was really a, a duet working on this. Of course, the next big step of mowers in Vienna was the Vienna World Fair in 1873. Uh, on this, we already heard the talk by Marianne Clemon, so I, I will not go in, in depth here. But as you heard, again, several mounted skeletons of mowers have been stars in these uh, exhibitions in the New Zealand Pavilion. At some point, the uh, object had to come to Vienna officially. So how did this work? This is a copy of our inventory book in the Natural History Museum of the Geological Pentological Department. And up to now, the moors didn't appear there. It's 1876 that the first time we find a mention, Reste von Dinornis, so remnants of Dinornis, uh, from the Hochstetter cave in the Aurora Valley, in the province Nelson, New Zealand. And it's written, it's a donation, it's a gift by Hochstetter. In December, 1876, it's 57 specimens to total. Uh, and the, the, the value that was given to this donation would equal today around 655 uh, euro, which according to a converter that I, I used are more than thousand uh, New Zealand dollar. So it was quite some money. And it's just, just fragments. So this was not an a, a entire skeleton. In the same year, uh, an, another uh, a bunch of objects came, more bones from the Canterbury Museum in Christchurch in New Zealand as exchange objects uh, from Julius Ritter von Haast. Uh, 
This, again, with a value of more than 2,600 euros, so this was a big uh, bunch of pounds. So one can say 8076, two, two big, big um, collections of more pounds arrived here officially. They have been in Vienna probably before, but now they were inventorized. The question is why? Why in this year? So that's easy, because Hochstetter knew what he's doing. This was his story because the museum that was founded officially in April 1876 and he was appointed director and he brought in his Moa bones as Laurie to say. So that was not coincidence. This was also very, very clear thinking. It goes on in 1878, the next uh, step of mowers in Vienna. And that's interesting because now we have more remnants from New Zealand again in the Canter in Canterbury province collected by Julius Reiter van Haast and donation by Dr. Carl Fischer in Sydney. So this was coming the tour. It was collected, the material was collected by Haast and it went to Sydney. And from there, for a reason ever, Fischer sent this to Vienna. And again, it's about 73 specimens, not, not a complete skeleton, but, but uh, bones. Again, a value of more than 2,000 euros for this. So it was in Sydney and then went to Vienna. And this is how this looks like. These are isolated bones, which are kept in drawers here. Many, many drawers of, of these, these bones here. Um, vertebrates. And at that time, Hochstetter was one of the brilliant geologists in Vienna, but there was a second one. It was Edward Seuss. He was probably even an even more important geologist with, with the even brighter ideas. He invented uh, terms like biosphere, lithosphere, hydrosphere. It's, and Edward Seuss was sitting at university. And for sure he was jealous uh, on, on this Novara success. And it was logical that he thought, we need mowers, of course. It's not possible that the museum has mowers and at the university, which is much more important, we don't have these this important skeletons. And from that moment on, he started a correspondence with Haast. It was um, studied in detail by Sasha Nolden, the correspondence of Edward Seuss with Julius von Haast in New Zealand. This published in, in the Geological Survey again. And here, Seuss wrote to Haast, uh, if, if it wouldn't be possible in an exchange or by buying to get some more remnants for our new exhibition in the geological collection of the university. And there were several letters and, and Haast was willing to do this. And they, they negotiated in the end, it, it did cost about 25 pounds. So again, a sum of around 2000 euro. So it is always the same Mm, amount of money involved in, in this. And this skeleton came also to Vienna and you can still see this now on display in, in the paleontological department of the University of Vienna. And it's, it's a mounted skeleton. So far, mounted skeletons are rather rare in the museum. This mounted skeleton here was, one is in the geological survey, the other one is at university. And interestingly, there is a next step in, in Moors arriving in Vienna. This was in 1884. And this is now not an, a copy of the inventory book, but this is from the acquisition book. And acquisition book just means that uh, things that rushed in were noted there without many details. And later on, uh, the details were put in, in the inventory book. In this case, it's written here that five skeletons uh, from New Zealand arrived again from the Canterbury Museum uh, by Haast. And probably as exchange, there is a question mark behind, so we can't solve this. I don't know why there is a question mark behind this exchange. And this was never put in the inventory, which is strange, but it can be explained by the fact that Hochstetter died in July 1884, and obviously nobody was caring after this uh, for, for the skeletons. So the department had to rearrange, uh, was internally split. 
And so this, in, this acquisition book was never translated into the inventory book. But these five skeletons now are mounted skeletons. And why are mounted skeletons now more important? Again, it, it's pretty clear. Here's one, one very early picture of the mounted skeleton in, in the Natural History Museum in Vienna. And now there were even plans for showcases. So this is a, an original drawing of a showcase which was built ex extra for the MOA exhibitions in the museum. And that's clear because the museum was founded already in 1876, but the opening was planned in August 1889. So in 1884, 1885, it was necessary to come up with objects for the display. And therefore now, uh, they tried to get dismounted skeletons here. So again, this was Hochstetter who was planning this, but unfortunately he was dying before the museum was opening. So that was a really a, a, a bad joke by, by Fortune. And these are pictures of, of the, some of these skeletons uh, on the left side, some in historical showcases, some, some uh, uh, mounted more or less in the original position. This is not much changed from what has been done in the 19th century with all mistakes in, involved in, in anatomy. And uh, this is a group of moors um, that were rearranged and mounted in a slightly more vivid um, position. And this you can now see in the, in the galleries. So they are on display, these three guys. So five, five mowers are on display in the museum and you are hardly welcome to, to have a look on these. And now you may say, oh God, it's 18,000 kilometers. So it's a, a big trip just to see the mower bones. And therefore we decided it would be nice to offer you a cheaper visit. And so we made 3D scans of, of one of the mower skeletons. There is one of my colleagues doing this. So we have a big program in, in digitalization of, of our objects. And now you can visit your, your mower digitally via Sketchfab. So if you, you, if you go to the homepage of Sketchfab and then you, you uh, type mower, then you will find this. And you can, can turn around this, you can move this in all directions, you can zoom in, you, you can, can study all details. So this is really very, very good uh, digital module of, of one of our models. So to, to open our collection to a really broad public. And I'm already close to the end of, of my talk. And I want to, to finish with one nice episode, which is another Austro-New Zealand connection, which goes back to Haast and which you may be aware of it, but, but which is very little known in Austria. Haast uh, had some correspondence with Bavaria and asked uh, Bavarian authorities if it would be possible to get chamois to, to New Zealand. And for some reason, which I, I was not able to solve, the, the uh, forest ministry of Bavaria was not really interested in this cooperation and, and it, it took years of, of negotiation without any results. And even after Haast, these negotiations continued, but then Austria stepped in and offered more. And in 1907, finally it was successful. And, and in one of the newspapers, it's written the arrival of the Chamois in New Zealand followed on March 14, according to a report in the Times from Wellington. As already reported, our emperor donated Chamois to the King of England of the English colonial government. On the other hand, lizards, parrots, and other rare animals came from New Zealand for the menagerie in Schönbrunn. So our zoo uh, got kiwis, you got chamois. So another nice story of Haast and, and Austria. And that was my talk, and I hope it, it was, was nice and, and some interesting points for you. Or, or so I know that you are aware of, of most of my stories. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Matthias. Really, really interesting from my um, point of view.